Uh, while everyone is gathering, I thought I would try and uh, get a little bit of information on who is in the audience. Um, so can we start with like how many people are undergrads? How many people are graduate students? Uh, hey, can you guys come together because we're already well behind and I, I'm trying to gather some information on who's in the audience and I have a very small audience that's paying attention. Um, how many people here have a kind of a technical background in, say, engineering or architecture? Uh, how many are pursuing legal? How many are pursuing uh, humanities and arts, or just a general liberal arts education? What am I missing? Real estate? Okay, that's a good one. Um, great. Uh, if everyone could uh, could sit down, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, we have a very short period of time, and I think you have a very interesting panel here. Um, as you know, we are going to be talking about corporate. Uh, my name is Pamela Lippi. I'm uh, the president and executive director of Earth Day New York, but I also uh, make my living actually as a green building consultant and have worked with a number of people on the panel. Um, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur, and, uh, and I think you're going to hear a little bit um, about business, but we can also talk about entrepreneurial efforts uh, both in the nonprofit and in the uh, for-profit world. Um, so I would like um, the panel to introduce themselves briefly and tell you a little bit about their organizations and what their role is and the relationship that they have to sustainability. Michelle, would you like to start? Hi, I'm Michelle Green from NYSE Euronext. That might be more familiar to all of you guys as the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and I work as the head of corporate responsibility at the New York Stock Exchange. And what that means in terms of sustainability is first our own internal operations. We're the only carbon neutral global exchange group. And um, we have over the past, I started there about three years ago, over the past three years, we've made a lot of changes to our own internal operations in terms of putting solar panels on our data centers, um, changing all of the windows on the historic New York Stock Exchange building to more energy efficient windows. Um, but actually, when I think about where we have the greatest impact, it's not in our own operations, because the truth is that our carbon footprint is relatively small compared to that of many of the companies listed on the exchange. Um, we have, as I'm sure you all know, uh, a great number of the world's leading companies are listed on our equities exchange, and so we have relationships with all of those companies. They are our clients. Uh, we have about, I think it's 8,000 companies, depending on how exactly you count it, but it's many of the companies that you all know and are familiar with and buy things from every day. And the way that we look at our relationship with them in terms of sustainability and in terms of where we have our greatest impact is that we really seek to use this as a way to connect with our companies and to help them in their own sustainability journeys. So we hold workshops, um, CDP workshops, GRI workshops, workshops that are focused on helping our companies um, do their own reporting and measuring around their own environmental performance as well as we, we do kind of all of ESG, not just E. Um, and then we also celebrate companies that are doing good work. Um, and we create collaborations where there's opportunities for companies to come together and either learn from each other about what has and hasn't worked or to work together on issues of common interest. So what we're really trying to do is mobilize the corporate sector more broadly in this space and to play a catalyt catalytic role in that regard. My name's Bryony Chamberlain. I'm the director for Megabus.com for North America. We're part of a wider group called Stagecoach Group PLC. We're traded on the London Stock Exchange. Terribly sorry. You know, it's not too late. <laughs> We're a very large company of about 35,000 employees. You'll know us uh, from, uh, many of you know us from the New York area with our Megabus.com services going between here, DC, Toronto, Philly. We've got a um, very strong green culture within the company. We're led by our owner who's uh, done a lot of work over in Africa and has some very strong beliefs about trying to change cultures, uh, deal with social justice, inequities. But the, um, that's really driven us towards the, the green end of the market. We see that um, there's many ways that we can direct green and I'm very much involved in that within our company. The, um, the one item you'll probably understand would be how we can work on green technologies. There's new different types of engines, new different types of vehicles that we work on, what types of fuels we can integrate into the systems. But then there's also much more interesting ways in the companies about changing the cultures of our employees. So that comes down into different types of training, how we can monitor via different types of technologies. 
it's all our vehicles are GPS tracked. I can see how long vehicles are idling, for example. We can manage down the use of, um, use of different fuels and our emissions through that. And then there's a more exciting um, way that we can encourage people and the wider culture to change. Since we started operating Megabus.com in North America in 2006, we've seen a very dynamic shift in the, in the use of intercity bus travel. And we can see that the culture is changing. So more people see us as a suitable alternative form of transport and get them out of the car. And we have substantial modal shift. We have something like 40% of our customers previously drove and are now seeing us as a suitable way to, uh, way to travel. So it's an exciting time for our industry and it's definitely growing. And it's all being led through, um, through all the managers getting involved and really being wanting to change what we can do both internally and externally. And that's a, a very exciting time for us. Uh, my name is Rob Watson. I'm the uh, CEO of Econ Group. And prior to going into the private sector, I was a senior scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council for 21 years. Uh, during that period, I founded the LEED Green Building Rating System, which is the world's largest and fastest growing green certification program. We have about uh, 12 billion square feet of projects in 130 countries, um, and uh, it, it continues to uh, grow and expand. Um, uh, LEED was part of a, uh, a market transformation uh, framework that um, in, in the course of developing standards and, and looking at how incentives and standards uh, interacted, uh, wanted to, to create um, you know, that framework where there was a regulatory push and market pull. And after I figured that the framework was in decent shape, I decided uh, that uh, sustainability was about implementation. And as important as frameworks are and as government are, at the end of the day, it's the private sector that does. And so <coughs> I, I thought that um, I would take my own advice uh, for people who came to me for career advice and not go to law school and not go to gra uh, I had a, I had a science master's uh, but but go get an MBA start a, start a green business and so I took my advice uh, after uh, 20 years in uh, the the field and I started uh, implementing projects uh, principally in, in China and Russia and found that there were very significant problems in the way projects were delivered. Everything was very highly siloed, very, uh, it was easy for the sustainability ball to get dropped between the owner and the design team, the design team and the builder, the builder and the operator. And so in forming Econ Group, what I wanted to do was create uh, a life cycle optimization framework and, and business delivery model for sustainability in buildings. Uh, in which the, the, the green does not get dropped over the life of the building. And so um, this is uh, a complementary industry transformation model uh, to go along with market transformation model, and it's, we're just getting it off the ground. Hi, my name is Amanda Kaminsky. I work with the Durst Organization. Uh, uh, the Durst Organization is a developer, owner, and manager of 11 million plus square feet uh, here in New York City. Um, I act as the sustainable construction manager to the Durst organization uh, and have been since about 2005. And uh, so you might ask what that means. What does a sustainable construction manager do? Well, um, I started off working on the Bank of America Tower at One Bryant Park and um, kind of further to what Rob just mentioned about ensuring that uh, goals uh, at the inception of a project get carried through, at least through construction and then obviously through the operation of the building. Um, I uh, really came on board to help fill that, uh, to carry that torch, I guess, between the design team and through the end of construction with all of the contractors. Um, and so I fill that role now and we have a lot um, w within the Durst organization, there's, um, a lot of different fields of expertise. My background is in architecture, um, and I really focus a lot on material streams. So uh, purchasing through uh, really a lot of our recycling and composting programs uh, at throughout our portfolio, not just within our own offices. So uh, the Durst organization, I, I don't know how much you guys know about the Durst organization, but their philosophy really is uh, leave this place better than you found it. and. Uh, the day-to-day -day operations really ring true to that. And at the same time, there's definitely a, uh, a, a need to ensure both, uh, you know, for our own purposes, that it's all within uh, the business case, but also we feel that it's, uh, it's smart to ensure that everything 
uh, is cost effective to so that so that it's really replicable by others as well. So uh, very rarely will we implement um, technologies uh, just as demonstrations um, if we don't think that they're really going to have a reasonable payback over time. Granted. The Durst organization's uh, payback outlook uh, is much longer term than most because we never flip buildings. We basically, um, you know, own properties for uh, for their life, and so we're a little bit more patient, maybe, with the payback than others might be. But um, so I think that's probably a good summary. Great. I, I think some of the most interesting things that we've been hearing today are the stories of how people got involved. And so I, I wanted to ask the panel whether, you know, is, was there any one defining moment um, when you suddenly found yourself on this path to sustainability or was it more a gradual process? Could you all talk a little bit about when you got, you know, when you had the uh, wake up call that this was something that you wanted to do? Um, so I guess I'll start. I have a super eclectic background, uh, and I'll give you the, the one-minute version of, of how I got here, because it was a twisted path. Um, <laughs> so I went to, I didn't take Rob's advice, I went to law school, um, <laughs> straight out of undergrad, and practiced law for a few years. Then I went to McKinsey, where I was a consultant for a few years. I'm going to sound really old by the time you add up all these years, by the way. <laughs> um, and then I uh, went down to Washington and worked for the Clinton, Depart the Clinton administration and the Treasury Department. Um, after that, I ran a human rights policy center, because where would you go from the Treasury Department other than human rights? <laughs> um, and so I ran a human rights policy center up at Harvard. Um, then I went back to the consulting field for a few years. Then I went into the Obama administration at the Treasury Department there. Um, and ended up at the New York Stock Exchange running corporate responsibility. Again, an obvious place to go, right? Um, so mine was not an obvious track to get here, and it was actually, um, I was not even fully aware that there were jobs doing this, to be honest, and it was actually my current employer who, when I, they heard I was leaving, and um, they had a big program around financial inclusion and financial empowerment, and that's something that I worked and ran at, at Treasury. So they liked me for that reason, and they were trying to figure out was there a fit for me in their organization. And when they looked at my background, they called me up and said, we want to start a corporate responsibility department, and you look like a really good person to do it. You have this totally eclectic background around governance and human rights and policy, and wow, that would be a great fit. So the environmental component of it was the piece that I was probably least qualified on, um, I, I joked that I speak environmental even before I took this job. Now I speak it much better, but I spoke it even then because my husband actually is very involved um, in environmental and energy work and, and um, worked in administrations on that as well. So, so I could speak the language, but it was really coming to this job that the environmental piece um, became part of my responsibility as well. And uh, the truth is that our global real estate group is just fantastic and has really been leading the way on that. So I know someone here said they were in real estate. I think that's... Um, within corporations, a place where there's an enormous opportunity for impact. So that's my twisted tale. <laughs> I probably have a slightly simpler tale. I went to <laughs> university to do maths and came out of that not having a clue what I wanted to do, apart from going to some sort of uh, management training position. So I was looking into heavy industry and I applied for a stagecoach group. They were the only company that sent me a job offer letter which had quotes from Winnie the Pooh in there. So I thought, <laughs> they've got to be a bit strange, I've got to give them a shot. <laughs> I've been working with them now for 18 years. It's, a, um, it's an interesting career path. I started off doing driving and dispatching, uh, doing local transit routes in the city of Manchester in the UK, and just uh, getting used to working with all these different types of people. It became interesting and developing as I moved through so many different cities and up towards the different types of uh, longer distance intercity and trying to change and work with governments and work with uh, different, uh, different uh, organisations about how we could improved modal shift and that really got me interested in what we can do as a longer term both from the um, the business side of it is there is a huge business benefit in uh, keeping your costs down low by being green and also encouraging customers over to you but what that means for the environment so that has made me feel that I could make some real change to the um, change to the world as well as looking after myself and looking after my company and my colleagues. Um. I, on the other hand, I think the universe had plans for me from a very early age. Um, uh, even before I realized it, um, I think my, my family did that I, I had an environmental bent. I used to get uh, subscriptions to Ranger Rick uh, magazine rather than toys from my uncle, and I was always very jealous of what my brother would get. But um, 
I think probably if there were a defining moment, um, it would probably be in sixth grade when I became absolutely obsessed with nuclear power through uh, getting the Atomic Energy Merit Badge for my Boy Scout. Um, Boy Scouts, Atomic Energy Merit Badge, I kid you not. Um, and I'm dating myself. Uh, and uh, at the same time, my uh, sixth grade science teacher lured me into volunteering at the, at the recycling depot every weekend uh, with the promise that I would get to keep the money from the returnable bottles, uh, which, you know, I could, I could clear six, seven dollars in a weekend. Back, <laughs> back then, that was a lot of money for a, a, sixth, a sixth grader. Um, but then I got, uh, I was blessed to run into some amazing people in college. Uh, uh, Amory Lovins came to talk, uh, at, came to teach at Dartmouth, uh, and I went out and helped build uh, Rocky Mountain Institute and uh, got about as uh, intense an education on the importance of buildings, which are the, literally the worst thing we do to the, to the planet. Um, and then uh, g hooked up with NRDC and got into the building standards, et cetera, and that, that sort of got me on the, on the trajectory. And then I had my aha moment about you know, private versus public sector. Not that there's anything wrong with government or private sector, but that was, it was time for me to go into that. So that's, that's been my trajectory. So I think um, I had always been interested in architecture from a very uh, young age. Um, whenever I was also in sixth grade, I did not win a merit badge, but <laughs> 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 but um, we had a task to build a tower that was six feet tall, uh, just from straws and pins, and it needed to support a tennis ball at the top. And I remember feeling very frustrated um, about trying to make that work, and eventually, once I did make it work, it was very satisfying. But then um, I started trying to make one out of popsicle sticks and like trying to use different materials. And I, from a very young age, was very interested in materials in general and um, building things. So um, whenever I went to college, uh, I went to University of Virginia. And um, sustainability wasn't uh, directly a, a huge focus there. And yet the, um, the campus kind of exemplifies it and its relationship with the community of Charlottesville. And I think um, you know, both socially and environmentally, it's a very healthy place. And um, we had a project that we were working on down in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, I was working on a bus station. And um, probably about a month from uh, the end of the project, of course, I decided to drastically change the design of my project and make it an electric uh, bus station. And I um, kind of probably got a little bit too into the weeds about how it would, how it would all work. but it made me think a little bit more about um, the implications of our design decisions and how, um, how you know, with one simple change, we can have a, a pretty different impact um, than what might be considered standard uh, design. Um, so when I moved to New York City um, at the end of, uh, I guess it was 99 or 2000, um, I was interviewing with various architecture firms and um, was asking them what their stance on sustainability or environmental uh, uh, issues was. And frequently I would get, oh, well, we specify recycled carpet. And then silence, and it was just like, OK. And so I ended up um, finding a really great um, firm that, you know, where the guy just said, hey, well, why don't you come out onto the site with me, and I'll show you. And uh, we, I, so that's what I, where I ended up working. We, we were, uh, he took me to a site where we were working on um, a geothermal system. and. Um, the thing that really uh, struck me was his uh, constant, you know, he would always tell me about something, but say how it wasn't, it wasn't good enough yet, and how everything was constantly being uh, basically optimized. And he never touted anything as being eco this or, um, you know, green that, or it was just the way it is, and it always needed to be better. And I think um, that really stuck with me. And um, I spent a lot of time on the construction site with that firm, and um, that also really stuck with me, and I realized how smart uh, contractors uh, can be if you really uh, give them the chance to uh, tell you about how things should be built or how, you know, their expertise on how things should be built. And I think that combination of really trying to consistently optimize and um, understand how, how things can be built better uh, during the construction phase, but then also in ongoing operations is where I kind of um, really locked in. Great. Uh, well, I also got obsessed with nuclear power when a <laughs> local utility decided to put a nuclear power plant about 20 miles from my college, which was when I really got right into the uh, sustainability, green, environmental field. Um, 
could everyone talk a little bit about what they think are the most promising opportunities or directions or tracks for young people today in the broad field of sustainability? Because as you know, we've been discussing, sustainability is a very big umbrella. Um, but there are, I think, uh, kind of increasing directions that, that are really hot right now. And I was wondering if you guys could talk about that a little. Um, well, I'll take the, the sustainability in the broad sense, because I think there are others here who can speak more to sustainability in the pure kind of environmental building sense. Um, my own view of where we're going with sustainability broadly within corporations is that, and I hope this is right, that other than, um, you know, kind of within the, well, no, actually, I'm not even going to caveat it. I don't think it's going to be a separate track. I think it's going to be integrated throughout businesses. So I think when people are thinking about going to businesses, that whatever role you're thinking of taking on, there is a sustainability element to it. Um, and you know, my my title is um, chief responsibility officer. There are people at other organizations who are chief sustainability officers. I hope that those types of positions disappear, because I think done right, it is integrated everywhere, and everybody has that responsibility and that role. So my own view of it is that it is being diffused throughout organizations, and wherever you go within an organization, it should be part of your job, whatever your job is. I'd say from my point of view, the uh, biggest thing that you can do in any career is the man management to really drive forward the change. We've got a, a huge team of people, and there's so many different ideas out there about how we can reduce our environmental impact. So we, we bring together green teams in the companies, and the ideas you can pull together from different people, and then if you can push it forward as a champion, as a manager, and really encourage other people to buy into it, it makes all the difference. We've done very simple little um, projects, such as taking people who've always had a paper paycheck and that's now getting emailed to them to their home email address. Simple things like that make all the difference. And then understanding some of the impacts within, um, within, your, uh, within any building, not just necessarily a transportation location. One of the ones which people have pointed out to me in the past is paper towels in the toilet. That is, uh, has a far larger carbon impact than a low energy hand dryer. Little things like that can be put into any type of building. And then on our specific in the transportation industry, there's so much technology and design that we need to work on. We don't have sufficient people who are able to work through the different types of technologies on uh, different types of fuels and how we can develop different fuels and then how we can distribute those. So I, I have um, locations where we operate entirely on 100% recycled chip fat and uh, food waste. Not, uh, not, we're not taking grain to make that into biodiesel. We're taking the waste from the food industry, putting that into our own diesel plants, making that, putting that into our local service vehicles but we don't yet have the, um, the infrastructure across the country for me to be able to use that same fuel, which is the most, um, most green type of fuel we can use on diesel engines, but we don't have the distribution network for that to be able to use it on long distance intercity. So our long distance intercity network, whether that be buses or cars or trucks, that is very constrained to the more standard types of diesels, where we can only use a, a small element of um, biodiesel. There's a huge range of projects within our industry where people can make such a difference, whether it's through their man management, their communication, or some of the technological changes we need to make within the entire country, within the world. Well, if, if you don't have a good grounding in sustainability, my opinion is that you're not going to have either a very interesting job or a, a, a job for very long. Um, and that's going to be increasingly true uh, as, as we confront um, uh, the wrath of Mother Nature. Um, uh, who is completely value-free and operates on chemistry, biology, and physics, and not economics, politics, and, and habit. Um, I think we've, uh, we're entering uh, an era in which information technology and data are going to be profoundly important. And I'm not talking about the trivial uh, applications and the virtualization that uh, all the brain power has gone into uh, so far. This is going to be... Uh, doing things like intelligent scheduling and, and uh, network optimization. You know, we're going to need three-dimensional thinking because that's, that's, those are the problems that we're dealing with. And sustainability requires three-dimensional thinking. So uh, taking data and figuring out how to optimize building operations, how to optimize the, the transportation system operations. Um, and it requires not only knowledge about information, but also how physical things work. And, and we're not talking about creating virtual worlds, but we're talking about the intersection or the convergence between the information world and the real world. And that's where the, the big opportunities I see coming down the, down the track, and not just in buildings, but I can speak
speak chapter and verse about that, but I see that being uh, overlaid in pretty much every every uh, uh, industry, and we're seeing a lot of it already. I think with um, with the consistent rise of uh, industry in um, developing countries, I think we're seeing a lot of um, change in our supply chains, and I think a, a much stronger uh, globalization of um, sources for our materials that we use on our projects. So, um, you know, th and further to that, I think uh, transparency and, um, you know, the being able to trust the data sources that you get that um, demonstrate that one product versus another product is, um, you know, is the one that you should be using on any given project, especially if it's broadly applied. Um, so I think that that globalization is definitely something that um, that's that's you know even within the last three to five years um, we're seeing a whole lot more. Um, another one is uh, a broader focus, more specifically on uh, health. Um, within our buildings and um, basically within the different phases of, um, you know, basically through manufacturing, um, through uh, the use phase of our buildings and then also through end of life uh, disposal considerations. Um, again, I'm looking at this from a material mindset to, um, to a, a strong degree and um, the way that all of that overlaps with uh, concerns about transparency and really being under able to understand what the building uh, buildings that we build are really made of because you take for granted that um, that the, all that's being reviewed by whether it be government agencies or um, somebody out there that you know uh, is ensuring that everything we're building with is safe and it's um, it's not really the case and so I think for a long time we've been looking a lot at um, energy which is which continues to of course be extremely important and very tied, very uh, intrinsically tied to, um, you know, concerns about energy usage are um, health considerations. If you think about reduction of carbon emissions and what a lot of the motivators are there, um, and so there's just different aspects, I think, of health that are really coming to the fore um, uh, as people start to understand better what, um, what we're building with. I'd, I'd like to underscore, you know, as, as you've heard from a number of these panelists, there, you know, there's increasing technical knowledge that's needed, you know, whether it's in finance with carbon trading or whether it's in materials being able to evaluate, you know, what are in the materials going all the way down to the molecular structure. Um, you know, all of these fields, as somebody who came out of school with a communications background and has been involved in the green building field for now uh, 17 years, that is something that has really changed. And that is a, a good thing in many ways because it means that, you know, we've had this impact and it's actually sustainability is being translated into the real world and we're having to figure out, you know, how to actually deal with it down to the at real details. You know, but I think that's, it's the one thing you've been hearing and I really want to underscore it, that it's very important to figure out, you know, what is the technical knowledge in your field that you need to master because that's going to, you know, whether it's a, a lead AP or, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, real detailed knowledge in terms of also the metering and the measuring, you know, I mean, again, that's a lot of detail, but it is increasingly important because people are, uh, and it's the same with materials, people are being asked to prove now, how is this green? And we're getting back to the green sourcing, you know, it's all about the details now. Um, could you guys talk a little bit more about kind of what, what are the most rewarding aspects of the work or alternatively, what are the most frustrating? Um, you know, this is a, a, a field that is, uh, you know, again, not exactly your standard, you know, lawyer, doctor, Indian chief kind of job. And uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about the emotional thrills and uh, spills uh, that one goes through in this field. So uh, on the rewarding side, and again, I, I'm speaking about sustainability broadly, but I think it's, it's actually seeing when what you work on every day has impact. Um, and, you know, I have the good fortune of working on a wide range of issues because we work with a lot of companies on issues that matter to those companies. So feeling that I'm able to make a difference on everything from, you know, carbon neutrality to anti-human trafficking. And like that's a that's a pretty cool job where I get to have impacts on a wide range of issues that that impact people's lives. Um, on the frustrating side, I think the frustrating side, and, and this I think is again less true on the environmental piece than it is on some of the other pieces of sustainability in the broadest sense, 
it, it's kind of proving the value and making the business case. And um, I think we've gotten at least part way there in some pieces of it, but there's a long way to go because I think there is a strong business case here. I think um, we are adding value and this is kind of the direction that business is going, but it's sometimes hard to identify the right metrics to show the return on investment in some of this work. So I would say that's probably my, my biggest frustration. From my point of view, the most rewarding thing that I've had from the Airbus.com experience was from starting in 2006 in the US, it took us 18 months to carry a million people, and we're now at carrying 10 million people per year. So it's seeing that huge change that's happened across our services, and we've seen that through the entire industry. So I've been you know, tracking a change in culture. You can see more people accepting use of the bus. It becomes sexy. It just used to be the way to go on a yellow bus to get to school, and now it's something that people will talk about and they accept as a, a good way to travel. So it's been exciting seeing that cultural change and then the impact that's had on our business. We've been able to recruit uh, it's a thousand or so people which work on the services within just the megabus.com branded services in uh, North America. And that's an awful lot of people to bring into work during this time. So it's interesting to see them you know, lead and develop and some of the people I've seen come up through the ranks. So that's going to be a real rewarding time. Uh, it's also been interesting working through on some of the safety aspects because safety not only has such an impact on well, your customers and your, your, your staff, you don't want to see anybody getting hurt, but also how that then translates into green as well. Because a safer driver who um, doesn't accelerate and brake harshly, he's also using less diesel. So there's le more technology we can bring in to integrate safety, and that has green benefits. So there's some hugely rewarding elements to my job, working with all those different people. There's also the uh, depressing times when I try and set up a new route and I get it wrong and then I get somebody coming down and shouting at me saying I'm losing money in a certain area. And that gets a bit depressing when I've, I've tried and tried and I don't get it right every time, I'll be honest. <laughs> I've had a couple of classic disasters. But it's just being able to stand up again and say, well, I've got that one wrong. I can work more. I can get other people, yeah, more people employed and get more people moving on. That's so how you learn. Yeah, it's how you learn. <laughs> Um, probably the most rewarding thing for me is the fact that my son is proud of me. Um, and, uh, the, you know, just the ability to look in the mirror and, and you know, knowing that there's, there's a big problem out there and that I've, that I've been able to move the needle on it. Um, uh, I think if, if you want to get something done, you really you need to bite a problem in the ass and not let go for 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, and so find something that you want to do that with and, and you will be rewarded. And it doesn't have to be at a giant level. Uh, it's just it's about making things better at whatever level you want to make them better, and then that's profoundly satisfying. Uh, the frustrating thing is is uh, always seeing how much is left to be done, and um, uh, just the tenacity of the status quo, and the in, in in my opinion the inability of people to see the obvious uh, in terms of uh, a different or better way to do things. I think with a lot of um, the additional information that's out there these days um, through technology and through uh, greater transparency initiatives, we've been able to have uh, much deeper dialogues with, uh, with basically everybody that's involved in uh, building a building. And um, I think that it's, you know, we started off um, with some of these health concerns, and um, Pam knows about this to some extent, but. Um, you know, with what she's working with too, um, where you know uh, it's difficult because we're trying to get some information that um, you know manufacturers may have deemed proprietary for a long time because they were able to deem it pr proprietary, and um, you know at first it's um, a, a very defensive um, stance that 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 they're taking, and then as the dialogue deepens and we start to ask, well, you know, why does there need to be carbon black in this? I don't care what color it is. Um, and carbon black is the tint, right? And, you know, they start to say, oh, well, you know, other people started, other people were asking about this 10 years ago and we just always, we just left it in there. If you don't want it in there, we can take it out. And it's just, you know, things like that that um, are simple and easy to do. And, you know, um, in another situation, why can't you get your recycled content and your insulation up higher so that we can specify your product? Well, because we actually have lead thresholds that we're not allowed to surpass within our manufacturing. Like, oh, well, that's a good thing. Maybe we will specify your product and not specify the other products. And it's just sort of digging into why things are the way they are and how they um, 
might be able to uh, be changed for the better has been a pretty, um, you know, th th this series of, um, of dialogues on that front um, has been pretty um, pretty exciting for, for us. I think uh, th the challenge sometimes because, I mean, it, it's wonderful that the Durst organization is constantly um, kind of pushing um, to improve with every project that um, that we do, but I think there's it's challenging because you know you're always trying to do something that you didn't do before and that um, maybe other people didn't do before, at least in the context of New York City or a high rise in New York City, and so there's a lot of room for failure, <laughs> and we do, and um, and so I think um, you know it's uh, I get really nervous every day and multiple times a day, but I um, also there's a there's room for a lot of gratification in there, but there's, um, I think, I think you just have to learn to um, think about the failures in the right way and learn how you do it better uh, the next time or differently the next time. Yeah, it's really hard to be a pioneer. Um, perhaps you all could talk a little bit about how important sustainability is today in the business world. Um, I don't know about you, but I am sensing kind of a bit of a retraction you know you so there was a lot of momentum that was building up there for a while and you know whether it's the economic um, you know retraction um, but I'm curious as to sort of how you see things today and and really and then what do you think is needed to continue the momentum to build the momentum to make sure that we achieve Michelle's vision of that this is just the way business is done uh, I think we got a ways to go uh, I'm sure you would agree um, but I'm curious as to, uh, you know, where you all see things today in relationship to the not too distant past and, and how we get to where we want to be in the future. So, so call me an optimist, <laughs> but I, I think we're actually continuing to trend in a positive direction. And, and the reason I say that is, is both kind of anecdotal and data-based. Um, when, when you look at what companies are spending on, um, specifically on, on sets of issues around sustainability, that number is going up and it even continued to go up uh, during the economic downturn. So I think that's a positive trend. Um, in terms of what we are seeing, in terms of companies that are actually tracking, measuring, and reporting on these issues, those numbers continue to rise as well. So, um, you know, I do think it's true that what gets measured gets managed, and I think the fact that companies are, are tracking this does matter and will cause them to um, actually manage it better. So I think we are still seeing positive trends, and in a broader sense, I think there is an increasing recognition that you guys um, and kind of the upcoming generations care more about this, and it matters to you when you're making your choices of what companies you're, you're going to work for. <coughs> and there's a real war for talent, so companies have to take that into account. Um, and I think the fact that um, your generation is also thinking about it more funda fundamentally in the choices you make as consumers is influencing companies as well. And then the final piece of it, I think, is that just this idea of a license to operate and what we expect from companies, I think we're holding companies to, to a higher threshold on that too. So. I think it's trending in a positive direction for a whole series of self-interested on the part of company reasons, which I think are good reasons, because that means they'll keep doing it even when the, when the economics go down. Uh, from our point of view, as a company, we're certainly being sustainable in as many choices as we can. We look at the, um, the whole life cost of a product, much in the way as man was talking about with the buildings. So it costs us more to purchase vehicles or to build our, our new facilities in a uh, green method. But then when we've invested in those types of technologies, we can look at it and look at the, uh, the cost of the operation. So I know I'll uh, expend less diesel or use less electricity, keep down my costs over the life of the, life of the, uh, the unit or the, the location. So we have to make that decision as a company for the, uh, the long-term benefits of our keeping our costs low. And we know that many consumers are going to look at us and choose us with uh, an understanding of our, our green principles. As a uh, wider picture within the entire industry, we see some of the, um, the companies, smaller companies who don't have the, the ability to expend the amount of capital that we do when they start up a new project. They will cut the corners and take the cheapest option then, which has a longer term increased cost and also a longer term increase in their carbon output. So companies like us can be held accountable to this, particularly under European legislation where we're accredited with the Carbon Trust, reducing our, our carbon output 5% per annum across the entire company.
but smaller companies may need more help in uh, being able to afford some of the, uh, the newer technologies to be able to reduce their carbon output because they can't have the capital expenditure at the start of any project that we can manage. So I see goods and I also see problems to be addressed. I think we a few years ago we had a bit of a sustainability bubble, um, and uh, it, it was you know fashionable. We had a lot of bandwagon, a lot of tourists, and uh, those guys are either you know because they don't feel it or don't get it, they might be falling off the bandwagon a little bit. Uh, but the guys who get it, the ones who are investing in serious, seeing serious returns, and maybe talking about it or maybe not because they see it as a significant competitive advantage, they're the ones who are going to end up uh, succeeding, and I think that's what we're going to see. So um, sort of like uh, the extra heat going into the deep ocean right now with, with climate change, and we're seeing a bit of a plateau in sustainability. Um, I think some of it's going underground uh, in part because it's just smart business, right? We don't need to talk about it as a special thing. It's just It, it just makes sense, and, um, you know, like early people were saying, lead is just good design. Yeah, it is. It's just good design. So why do we need to talk about it? Why do we need to, to do the extra stuff? Um, but I, you know, I, I think that as more data gets out there about the superior performance of holistically integrating sustainability at all levels, uh, when it's in the DNA of the organization, you'll see them do well, uh, better financially. Uh, they'll attract and retain better people, and they'll have a much, uh, they'll have a significantly lower environmental footprint, which consumers will reward because they are more interested in that. You guys have mostly said it all, I think, but um, but I, I do agree that there's a, a much deeper integration of all of this um, in, in every uh, business that I um, interact with. And I think that there's also maybe maybe there's some less use of the word sustainability and maybe there are other terms that are being used a little bit more. I know internally um, we consistently talk about optimization of all of our practices and you know I think even um, the concept and um, practice of resiliency um, has a lot of overlap with sustainability and obviously we've been talking a lot about that here in New York City. Um, so I think um, I, I agree with what everyone's saying that it really um, it really does uh, factor into and is, is more and more trickling um, down into all levels of, of business as um, standard practice um, when it's done well. So, and I think I'd like to add. I think the point is that there's there's still a role for you. Uh, you know, it is really important that your generation kind of enter the workforce, whether it's in the nonprofit, in the governmental, in the for-profit world, you know, with a commitment to making change within your own organizations. Um, and as you've seen from these panels today, it's not necessarily a straight line to, uh, to get there ever, um, but that you can build on all of your experiences um, and, you know, taking this mindset, you know, into the future um, and figuring out ways to make it operational, figuring out ways to optimize things, to take these issues into account is really critical. So who has some questions for our panel? Could you stand up and speak loudly? Yeah. When you have a leadership standard like like uh, lead, um, you know the the challenge is all you know how far, how fast, right? If 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 we look at it as an engine that's drawing an industry train, uh, a lot of people want to make the engine go faster, right? But uh, at at some point you're going to break that coupling with the rest of the train, right? So if the point is to make the train go faster, you want to keep the engine coupled to the rest of the market. So it's not going to it's not always going to be able to go as fast <laughs> as it can. And so it's, it's that tension of stability and innovation that's always going to be a challenge for a standard like LEED. And I think, um, you know, 
beyond lead, uh, you know, living building challenge, you know, those kinds of things. And I think we'll probably s end up seeing tiers of standards where there's, you know, if it were any worse, it would be illegal, which is basically code and, you know, minimum laws. Uh, then you'll see uh, leadership standards like lead and then maybe bleeding edge standards sort of trying to, trying to go beyond, you know, the, the, the thing that's trying to, trying to create something for, you know, that, that, that half a percent of the market that, that is at the super uh, bleeding edge of innovation. And my guess is that given the success um, of the dynamic that lead has had, for example, with regulations, it's, it's created a profound change in the regulatory structure in buildings. That's probably an order of magnitude greater than the impact of lead itself is, is the fact that it's influenced ASHRAE and, and standards all over the world. That's the real, you know, that's the real exciting thing, I think. Yeah, and I think uh, further to that, there's, uh, you know, in looking at data, um, you know, on other buildings, for instance, I think uh, appreciating the context and the vernacular of any given, of the data from any given other building or development or um, city um, throughout uh, the U.S., throughout the world, is really important in, um, you know, in, in, in really truly understanding how it might be applicable to, um, to what you do. And so um, I think through that, um, you know, like the case, uh, case studies are very interesting and lessons learned. Frankly, I typically find um, the more interesting data um, is, you know, what, what went wrong or what wasn't, what didn't work with, um, you know, with that project or with that building or with um, that business and why. And um, it's usually, the juicier stuff that you don't usually have access to because people don't like to tout that, but um, I think um, that's kind of happens on a more personal level that you get, you know start to understand those things too and how you can learn from them. But um, but I think really putting everything into context and understanding how it applies uh, to your situation is is an important part of that parsing of that data. Just the, so, uh, being able to crap detect is super important because everybody <laughs> everybody. You know, big data this, big data that, but a lot of times it's just big garbage. Uh, you know, you look at the sensors in buildings and they're terrible. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're getting all this data and we're massaging it and we could be making completely wrong assumptions and wrong conclusions because the data is no good. So again, having having that, you know, that craft detector hat on, does this make sense at a fundamental level is gonna be super important. Yeah, I mean, it's the interpretation. Uh, and, and then there's what are you gonna do about it? Uh, once you have the data and you understand you have a problem, you know, a lot of times they're really deeply ingrained in the way business is done. And so, you know, getting back to the change management issues, you know, that is a really critical element because data is not enough, you know. Uh, first of all, you got to make sure that you can figure out what the data is telling you. Then you have to figure out what you're going to do about it once the problem is clear. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, data is important and it's increasingly, you know, a focus and it's an important focus. Uh, but, but getting beyond the data and, and interpreting the data is also really critical and that takes judgment and, uh, and uh, other skills as well. Um, any other questions from the audience? I think we have a couple more minutes here. Yes? So um, I'll jump in on that one. We do a lot of public-private partnership work, not just for ourselves, but also facilitating it among our member companies. So we work with a number of different nonprofits, um, uh, GRI, uh, the UN, uh, the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, the World Economic Forum, the World Federation of Exchanges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, because I think that it's not a, an issue that one sector can solve by itself. And um, we recognize that I different sectors can learn from each other about different elements of the solution um, and can contribute to those conversations. So we really see a, a kind of collaboration across sectors as absolutely critical to all of us doing a better job in w the part, the role that we play. It requires talking across sectors to do it more effectively. We would have a, a different type of view in this 
uh, particularly in terms of our local transit operations, which we run across the US and the UK in particular. Uh, we're very much into public-private partnerships, but what we do has to be a local focus. If we're running the local transit, you know, equivalent to the MTA buses that you see outside here, it has to be very locally focused what you can do. But the more of those you roll out across more cities, across more countries, that has that kind of benefit. You've got to have that local interaction between local city governments, the local companies investing into these different projects, and uh, in some cases you're also involving like the local communities as well. So we've built things like uh, guided busways through city centres, and there's been some major infrastructure proje projects like that, which generate modal shift of people coming out of cars, seeing it's a worthwhile op um, opportunity for them, and makes it a more cost-effective operation for us, as we're not stuck in traffic, increasing congestion, increasing our, our diesel intake. So there's many different projects we can do, but all locally focused. I guess I'd argue that um, a public-private par partnership or, or a market transformation approach is the only thing that really works. If regulations give you one, if market signals give you one, when you coordinate them and combine them, you get three, not two. So they work together better uh, than either would separately. So it's not an either or, it, it, it's a both and. And that's, that, that's the lesson we have to learn. Um, you know, I think we need to have more of a social and, and broader uh, societal focus in business. And I also think government needs to learn how to be more efficient and more bottom line oriented. Uh, we don't do much globally considering um, everything that we do is in Midtown Manhattan for the most part. We have, there's some exceptions to that, but, um, but there, you know, we do have some interaction, a good amount of interaction, w um, you know, with the city. Um, and um, sometimes we work to, you know, pilot um, various programs with the city to, to demonstrate efficacy before a, a broader rollout. And um, it's good for us and it's good for the city and, um, and everyone else. So um, one example is the recent high rise residential organics collection program. So um, which we've just begun over the last year. So do you have a question? Anyone else? Last question? So, sure. Uh, she was asking about uh, making the business case and whether Ed, there's any experience in the panel regarding making the business case within their own companies. Is yeah. So absolutely, and I think um, that's a critical part of anyone who's in my role is to show why what you're proposing aligns with the broader corporate strategy, why it contributes to the broader corporate strategy, and why it's part of the business case and. Um, the metrics can sometimes be tough, but I think um, w we see a lot of success with these sorts of efforts um, being seen throughout the businesses as promoting the business, both the general idea of sustainability, but then specific projects. You know, why are we going to put those solar panels on that roof? Um, and also, why are we going to work on the broad issue of sustainability? So I think from the project level to the kind of conceptual level, we're making the business case all the time. Um, for, to the shareholder issue, it's interesting because you see shareholders on both sides of it, honestly. There's, there's activist shareholders who are saying, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you, you know, more out in front on this and, and getting even better results? And um, then you also have shareholders who say, why are you spending money on that? So from a shareholder perspective, I think it comes in both directions. But I think when you look at the big institutional investors right now, um, there is a growing awareness that there seems to be, and I won't say causation here because we definitely don't have causation, but there does seem to be some correlation between businesses that think about this progressively and businesses that perform well financially. Well, certainly from, uh, for Stagecoach and Megabus, we do have to ensure that any new projects we do are going to have a, a, green, uh, a green vision behind them. So we've just built a, a major new facility up in uh, Chester, New York State. And that there that has been designed to ensure that it is going to have you know, efficient heating, efficient uh, lighting. We uh, it's, uh, enclosed, even with all the vehicles coming out, so you can shut the doors and keep it warm during winter. It can be a bit chilly up there. So we do try and work through all those things and make sure we've got the right technologies. 
and the board understands that uh, green has to be a major priority for us. We see it as um, both beneficial in terms of the costing long-term life. But, um, we also have uh, certain metrics we have to report in terms of our carbon output under the EU Carbon Trust. And if we fail on those, there is a um, financial implication on us down to the, um, the tax level we have to pay at our corporate levels in, in Perth. And we also see that people do invest you know, with uh, the green dollar or the green pound behind them. So there's many reasons to do it. Some of the um, finer points of exactly what type of solar panel or exactly how much you're going to invest on the green side, there's always a bit of a debate around that. But they, we certainly find there's plenty of support within the industry and within the, within the company itself. My firm is called Econ for a reason. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we think that sustainability is good business. And, in fact, it's the only way to do business. Uh, convincing others of that can be challenging because uh, a lot of times people look at uh, benefit from a two-dimensional perspective and looking at savings as being where the value lies, particularly in buildings. Um, but taking it in a three-dimensional perspective, you look at where the real value is, which is in uh, the brand value to your company, the ability to get more productivity and more satisfaction out of your workers, the ability to attract and retain uh, better customers and better people. Uh, that, that's where the real value is. And so in making the business case, we try and present a three-dimensional business case, not just a, a two-dimensional business case. And, and, and the smart ones get it, and they're the ones who are going to be around for a while. So we do a lot of internal cost-benefit analyses, and um, those uh, then can be used to help um, others throughout the industry um, understand why we did or did not implement um, various technologies, um, even if, you know, for others, um, it was more about uh, cost savings for us. A lot of times, uh, further to what Rob just stated, um, you know, we, we factor in, for instance, we put green roofs all over a lot of our buildings. Um, it, um, you know, it was a upfront capital cost for us, but there's a, a number of uh, residents of our own buildings that look down onto those green roofs, so it improves their, um, you know, their well-being on a daily basis. Um, but it also, we also feel that it um, improves.